it's not going to tell you if it's actually going to rain, but what it does tell you is how surprised you should be if it does rain. It's a 7% move. That's a big deal. Guess what else it is? It's a 5.6 standard deviation move. That's a massive move. And it's not just notable. It's like, pick up the phone and get someone on the phone, call the risk desk kind of notable. You're watching Excess Returns. I'm Matt Ziegler. This is a new series, educational stuff on Excess Returns. Go figure. We're calling it Teach Me Like I'm Five because, well, I'm five at heart. And in many ways, I'm joined today by Principal of Investor Education of the OCC, Matt Cashman. That's Matt with one T kind of like Mr. T, if you think about it that way, on LinkedIn, and the writer at optionseducation.org. Matt, welcome to Excess Returns. Thank you for having me, Matt, with two Ts, Ziegler. It's nice to be back. I'm always happy to be here talking with you and talking about options. This is a beautiful thing. Today, we are going to talk about something called The Rule of 16. It's not just a Molly Ringwald movie, right? Tell me what this thing is. How's it relate to uh, oh, it's not a Molly Ringwald movie? Although I, that's a that's a good one. I think we might uh, we might try to write a script and and uh, sell it in Hollywood afterward. Anyway, uh, Rule of Sixteen is basically a short form kind of back of the envelope way that people in the options business have been breaking down annualized volatility into much easier and more useful daily expectations of movement. So I'll walk you through how that works, but it's basically, that's the that's the high level idea. Okay, why do I care about annual volatility? I'm building a portfolio, I'm doing something, I'm trying to think about how volatile one security is in the broader reference set. Why do I care about making that a smaller number at all if I just know how volatile it is in the first place over a year? Well, I think the main reason why we care about that is because we don't really trade in year-long chunks, right? Most people don't trade in year-long chunks. And what they get is this implied volatility number kind of like spit out by the market at them that many times, even if they understand that it's an annual metric, they don't necessarily, uh, they're not able to necessarily make that transition from what that annual metric means on a daily basis. And so it allows you to build expectation into how much you expect something to move, how much the market expects something to move, and then to be able to build a framework around that so that you can figure out when the actual movement that you're seeing is within the realm of expectations and when it's outside of the realm of expectations. And so that's how I like to think about it. I love this, especially because we're taking something that we understand or we talk about all the time in an annualized level. And now you're saying, here's how not just to think about it, but how to actually use it. So start, like I'm five, we're in the sandbox. I got my Tonka trucks. What the hell is this thing? How am I going to use it? <laughs> All right. I love this. So here goes. Imagine that you have this really bouncy ball and some days it barely moves and other days it bounces all over the place. Now imagine that someone tells you this ball, this bouncy ball that I'm about to give you goes really high. It bounces really high 16 times a year. So you have this idea as a little kid that like this thing bounces, but I don't really know when it's going to bounce and like what to expect from it, but I know it's going to bounce. Right. And so what we want to do is figure out how much this thing might bounce today. How much are we going to think about the expectation that that big bounce is coming today? And we use something called the rule of 16 to slice that big yearly idea of bounces into a much smaller expectation. So it's kind of like cutting, a, in five-year-old terms, it's like cutting a sandwich into 16 pieces, right? Each, each little piece of that sandwich, how much we might expect the bounce to happen on any average day, right? Okay. In my five-year-old scenario, we'll remove all the crusts first mm. and then leave me just with the good stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're on the same page. Good. Okay, so I'm on it. I have this ball. I know it's going to bounce 16 times, but now that doesn't tell me if it's going to bounce once or three times tomorrow. And you're telling me this is a way to start to understand how to focus that up on the here, the now, the present, even though I have this, this broader level understanding of how it should act. Correct. So in these terms, the, the bounciness of that ball is the volatility, 
right? The actual amount that that thing's gonna bounce around is that volatility number that you see spit out by option prices. And what you're really doing is trying to figure out what that means as to how many times it should bounce on any regular day. And that's kind of like how I think about it in a very like five-year-old term. Wonderful. Let's level me up. I'm out of the sandbox. I'm evolved. Maybe went to school. Now I'm five years in the business. How am I thinking about this? If I'm trading my own account, if I'm thinking about stuff online, why do I still want to be paying attention to the rule of 16 and thinking about probably trade decisions, you know, today, tomorrow, next week? Right. So let's look at it with a little bit more of some, some real metrics that you might see. Here's how I like to frame it. The rule of 16 gives you a way to a sense, in, in a sense, it's a way to shortcut to a de-annualized implied volatility level. So if a stock has a 20% implied vol, if the options on the stock that you're looking at have a 20% implied vol and it's trading a hundred bucks, the stock is trading a hundred dollars. You multiply that vol, that implied vol of the option, you, you, um, you turn it into a decimal. So a 20% vol is 0 0.20. And then you multiply it by the actual stock price, which would be 100 in this case, if you're dealing with a $100 stock, and then you divide it by 16. And that number is the actual daily standard deviation that is expected in price movement for that $100 stock. So if you do the math in your head, Matt, what does that equal? Oh, in your, in your head. 125. Your... Exactly. I did it before. 1.25 is correct. So in that case, what, what we're looking at here, if you're looking at an option that has a 20 vol and the stock is trading a hundred bucks, that means that the market is pricing in an expectation on average that the stock is going to move about a buck and a quarter per day. Now it doesn't mean that's actually going to happen. It's not like, it, it's not a guarantee, but what it does is it sets your baseline right? It sets your baseline for expectation of movement going forward. I love this because this is the right now today in my weather outside of my window, I know there's like a 30% chance of rain. Yes. And that's enough to say I have to look at the radar before I walk the dogs in a little bit. Yes. Because it's, it's this type of awareness of where am I a relative to baseline right now? Is that a fair yeah. way to say this? It's a great way to think about it. And I love that. And I also love the idea that it's kind of like that weather forecast, but it, it's not gonna tell you if it's actually going to rain, but what it does tell you is how surprised you should be if it does rain. And then additionally, how surprised you should be if it really rains for a long time, right? Like, and really pours. That is really what we're talking about here. It sets your baseline expectation and then allows you to figure out like, okay, how outside of the norms uh, is what I'm seeing happen in front of me right now. All right. So now theoretically we're moving past the BA2 plus age and I want to zoom us up to, I don't know, AI supercomputer or at least using Excel like a civilized yeah. person. Somebody who's yeah. been doing this 25 years. How are they thinking about the rule of 16? Have they long forgotten it? Does a pro still care? Yes. So the, the beautiful thing about this it, from a function of of how it's put together. It's a, it's a very simple concept, but you can use it in lots of different ways. At this level, when we're talking about someone who's been trading for 25 years, we're not just talking about volatility as a number, we're talking about how the market actually digests uncertainty or certainty as things move forward. And when you see implied volatility, what you're looking at is those expectations being embedded into the option price. And that's really what what implied volatility is. So when we're thinking about it at a high level, when you convert that number into a daily standard deviation using the rule of 16, now you have that basic framework, that, that like baseline expectation. But what that allows you to do is it also allows you to assess how extreme the move that you're seeing in front of you actually is. So let's take that example that we just talked about. It's a 20 implied vol and the stock's trading a hundred bucks. We just said, right? Do you remember? Do you still have the number on your, on your calculator? What was the standard deviation? It was 1.25, right? Oh yeah. Okay. 1.25. You're expecting 1.25 of movement on any normal average day. 
Now, let's say you're trading that $100 stock, you walk in one day and there's some sort of corporate event or some great news that comes out, stock's trading 107, right? It goes up seven full dollars. Now, anyone's gonna look at that and say like, this is a big move. But when you have the actual standard deviation kind of tattooed on your brain as to how much that thing should theoretically move on any normal day, you're able to look at it and say, this is a $7 move. It's a 7% move. That's a big deal. Guess what else it is? It's a 5.6 standard deviation move. That's a massive move. And it's not just notable. It's like pick up the phone and get someone on the phone, call the risk desk kind of notable, right? So that part is really important when you're looking at it from the perspective of someone who's been trading for a long time. You can use this in a way that allows you to adjust your expectations going forward. Is part of the realization, and I'm thinking of this through the 25 year market veteran world, it's like everybody else in my seat who's paying attention to this is now freaking out. Like somebody did something that there's a whole bunch of us now freaking out because, oh my God, a five and change standard deviation move just happened. Yeah. And yeah. none of us were seeing this as a probable outcome. Yes. Well, and that's what you saw most recently in the marketplace in, in April, right? I mean, like these kinds of moves were happening on a daily basis. And I personally think that the people who are, who already have this expectation built into the way that they think about things, just like right when they look at the vol, the implied vol, or in this case, the, the VIX are able to just make that and use that number to calculate, okay, this is what my expectation should be going forward, but something just moved, you know, five and a half standard deviations. Is that what I expect? Is that what I expect to go to happen going forward? And so, and, and yes, to your point, I think that's interesting when you think about it from the perspective of sitting in a seat and understanding that everyone else who sits in that seat is thinking that same thing. The crowd mentality is a very powerful thing, right? If everyone else knows this and I don't know this, like, am I at some sort of strategic disadvantage? Who knows? But it does affect how people look at things like that. And the best part about this is that it's dynamic, like it's moving around. Implied volatilities move around all the time. So if you, let's, let's go back to that example, that $100 stock that moves seven bucks and you see it as a 5.6 standard deviation move, but let's also think about it in terms of after that $7 move, the implied vol is no longer 20. Let's say it like doubles or something over the course of that move. You're able to look at it and almost instantaneously say, has the marketplace changed in a way where I would expect, you know, two and a half dollars of movement out of this $107 stock instead of just a buck and a quarter? Is that relevant? Is that real? Is that what my expectation is? Because what that does is it colors how you think about your option position. Let's say you walked into that move and you were long options. Well, generally speaking, you're, you're probably doing pretty well in that move. And if you're short options, you're probably not doing so well. But the idea behind it is that you're able to pretty quickly look at the implied vol and then say, does this change how I feel about my options position going forward? Because the expectations are now priced in a completely different way. Okay. So shifting and let's focus on just the options trader mentality of this, whether I'm an industry vet or I'm just trading options and learning this for the first time. The first thing I want to do is understand what these moves are and what my baseline assumption can and should be. That's yes. step one, understand your baseline. Yeah. But then step two is sort of the reaction function to these things. I have to assume, you know, volatility clusters. So I see a move like this. It doesn't mean like, oh, just bet in the other direction. Right. There's a whole bunch of other analysis that needs to go into this because that ball, even if it's only supposed to bounce 16 times in a year, yeah. unpack that for me, how you understand sort of the reaction function and how, it, how a person should think about it. The reaction function to it should be, I think, guided by being able to, number one, look at the metrics and understand, first and foremost, what they're telling you and for how long that duration is. So if you're looking at something that's like a 30-day option and, you, and it has a certain implied vol, that expectation for movement is priced in for the next 30 days at this moment in time. And so 
the reaction function of understanding how those things change and what they mean going forward is, I think, a really important part of this, because like we said before, everyone is looking at it, or not everyone, but most people who are experienced in that way are looking at it in that way. And so you need to be able to adjust quickly. And in order to adjust quickly in those circumstances, you have to understand what the baseline is, right? And that's, I mean, it's it's a, to me, it's a function of just educating yourself as to what the numbers mean, right? Yeah, I'm thinking back to my dog walk analogy. It's like, I'm going to look out the window. I'm going to pull up the weather map. I'm going to yeah. actually look at the weather so that if it if it is raining, the question is, is this just a drizzle and there's just one little tiny green patch right over my house and that's right. all I should expect? Or yeah. is it, oh my God, there's a, there's a monsoon and this 30% could continue all afternoon. Then that's going to shift if it's, we're just going into the backyard or if we're yeah. like on a, a six block walk, right? Yeah. And it affects how you do it. It affects how you like, what your expectation for that next 20 minutes is, right? Is, is affected oftentimes by either looking at the map and seeing what is coming or, right? You can always just walk outside and be, <laughs> right? What's going on? That's the other part of this. There are parts of it that you can inform by just looking at clues that the market is giving you. And that's something that you can also use in that decision-making process. Not only is the implied vol of what I'm trading right now important, but like what's going on around me? Where does this implied vol fit relative to all the other things that are around me as well? And that's the act of like walking outside and looking up and seeing whether or not it's actually raining, right? That's, um, and so I think that's important as well. Matt. You're truly a sponge for this in information, which is a tortured way for me to say 16 candles down the train. Thanks yeah. for coming on Excess Returns. Yes, I love it. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of the participants or their clients.